Well, I think anybody who owns property that's insured should tune in for this because there's a lot of things that go into the pricing of a policy, the natural surroundings, the roof categorization as far as a health score of the roof, what the property looks like, how well maintained, what kind of defensible perimeter have you created? Do you have huge trees hanging over? Good morning, good evening, Matthew Grant here, and delighted you can join us again, or if this is your first time, well, a very big welcome. Now, we're well into the new year here in London, but it is very cold, and I'm guessing if you're in the Northern Hemisphere just now, pretty cold where you are too. So keep warm on your run, walk, or whatever you're doing whilst you've got us plugged in. But we're off to a flying start this year, and I'm back talking this time to the new CEO of Arturo, Marty Smuin, to discover what has been happening with aerial imagery in the last year. Now, AI and generative AI in particular loves making sense of complex data and helping us all make the right decisions. So it's no surprise that aerial imagery is now coming at the resolution of the size of your phone or mobile device when we looked at from space. And Arturo is one of the companies processing hundreds of attributes of data so that property assessors no need to climb onto ladders and expect roofs anymore. Well, I guess it's kind of hard to get insurance for that anyway. But Keep an eye out for what we've got coming up at www.instec.co. We've got live events in the UK and the US, more reports, and we're seeing a massive increase in insurance people signing up for our webinars. Let us know if we can help, and please do keep telling us what you think on LinkedIn or by email. But now, here's Marty. Marty, Great to be talking to you. You are calling in from Utah, which uh, I think you might be the first person from Utah joining us. What's Utah like today? Utah is very snowy. The skiing is great if you're into that and you're looking for a place to ski, but it's very cold. Uh, For Utah standards, it's a great day. We've got good powder. We're going to be talking a little about some of the ways you're looking at helping insurance companies assess risk, but you yourself actually are in the proximity of some sort of major natural hazards there. And actually, I think I've had some experience of being quite close to some. Utah just naturally sits on fault lines. As a matter of fact, just about 500 meters above my house is a major fault line. So, you know, we carry earthquake insurance. Oddly enough, we also carry flood insurance because of a massive fire that we had that just took out the entire mountainside right up above my house here. So with all that vegetation gone, we've had some flooding issues. We've had water drainage issues. And, you know, the city has tried to mitigate that. But yeah, we've had uh, seismic activity, fires and floods all within the last four years, just right here within, within a half mile of my house. So yeah, we have some interesting conditions here in Utah. Crikey, but, but hopefully it didn't actually impact you directly. They didn't approach the house itself. We had to evacuate for the fires, which, you know, seemed like a very prudent thing to do. But uh, yeah, no houses were actually burned. There was quite a bit of flood damage because it accompanied with a uh, a semi-mud letting, a flow of mud throughout throughout some neighborhoods, which impacted basements. But the fire didn't burn anything down. Fascinating. I mean, we just learned so much at these kind of discussions from the personal point of view. And your point about now needing flood insurance because... You know, the vegetation has gone from the hillside is you know, something that people might not always think about and actually leads quite naturally into discussion we're going to be having about what you're doing at Artura. So you're broadly a property intelligence company. You've got a mission to provide clarity around the past, present and future risks associated with the property. And I know there's intention in the choice of the words in there. You found it back in 2017. I know you've got clients in the US and Australia and Marty Smoon, you are CEO. That was my kind of elevator pitch. Is there anything critical I've missed in there? No, I mean, we are on a mission to change the way that the world views property. And, you know, our technology does just that. It provides the uh, insight into the past, present, and future of property, which uh, is the most expensive thing that most people will ever try to protect in their lives. But you uh, you nailed the introduction. So thank you. Great. Well, look, we've got a very dedicated audience, some of whom get up at seven o'clock in the morning, UK time. Just to make sure that we keep them listening to us, just a kind of brief synopsis about what people are going to be learning in the next 30 minutes, what can you offer? 
Well, I think anybody who owns property that's insured should tune in for this because there's a lot of things that go into the pricing of a policy, the natural surroundings, the roof categorization as far as a health score of the roof, what the property looks like, how well maintained, what kind of defensible perimeter have you created? Do you have huge trees hanging over. I mean, these are all things that go into uh, pricing the premium for your insurance. So anybody who has property that's insured, I think will get quite a bit out of this segment. And then Marty, you've been in your role for a couple of months. What attracted you to this role you know, and what brings you here from your past experience? It'd be useful just to get some, some of your own personal background and, and sort of what's driving you to take on the role. Well, I was very fortunate. I got in at the very beginning of e-commerce and actually, uh, you know, participated in the development of many of the e-commerce platforms that uh, that we use today. And then I transitioned from that into wireless technology, which at the very beginning of wireless technology, we were trying to solve a lot of interesting problems, just like e-commerce. I mean, we, you know, you look at the technology advancements and technology is always on your side, right? Because technology is going to advance and the principle of the more we know, the more we can know, and that's certainly relevant to what I'm, I'm doing now. But um, in my past, I have addressed some very serious technology limitations, you know, whether it's trying to take an image and send it over a wireless network in packets and have them all form in the way that they were sent. A lot of people just do that today. We do it all the time. We're streaming right now. Well, you know, 15 years ago, we were trying to figure out how to make sure that the voice matched the video and that the video wasn't being delivered latently and, you know, very sporadically. I mean, these were major problems that we were trying to solve, but technology solved all of these. And the thing that really attracted me to take the CEO role of Arturo after sitting on the board for two plus years now is the problem that we're solving and the way that it can be solved. Traditionally, insurance has been a very manual, a very labor intensive work. Individuals going out, looking at property, crawling up on roofs to inspect, going in the house, looking at the surroundings and getting a human in the loop visual inspection of things while they fill out a little clipboard. And I think we can change that. And that's what attracted me to this. We can use technology to dramatically enhance risk mitigation quicken claims, detect fraud, all by taking characteristics uh, and attributes from images and repurposing that in many different ways. But this is a problem that we're seeing you know, throughout insurance that can be solved through technology, reduce cost, quicken time, better the customer interaction and, and customer relations so you get a better customer SAT score. So what is it you're looking to do in 2024 and, and excites you about being part of Arturo? What, what are the problems that the insurers and others haven't yet figured out how to solve with the technology? You still have a lot of insurance companies that have built on very rich legacy processes. And those are driven by the technology that they have um, implemented. But the good news is, is that the wind is kind of, you know, behind our backs here and pushing us forward across the entire industry because we are seeing a massive change within insurance companies as far as adopting new technologies is concerned. So, you know, the challenge in, uh, that, that they're really trying to, to solve here is how can they get more information from imagery, because imagery, as you said, it's it's nothing new, right? But you have different types of, of imagery. You have satellite imagery, you have balloon imagery, you have imagery from aircraft. All of these are different size imagery, like a satellite would be 20 centimeter. What does that mean? It means one pixel represents, you know, 20 centimeters of a roof or, you know, a drone is actually a fantastic way to get imagery. However, there's a lot of regulations around what can be done with drones. You can't fly beyond visual line of sight in the U.S. or many other countries. Uh, you have to have permission to fly over residential areas. So the most useful type of imagery for us is really and truly aerial imagery that's captured from an aircraft. Very, very high resolution, seven centimeter, which means, you know, you can, in one pixel, you can get seven centimeters of view of a roof. So we can tell you everything you want to know about a roof or a piece of property with that quality. So, you know, the technology has advanced with the algorithms, machine learning, 
and data modeling. And that is what I think is the biggest progression that we're, we're trying to get adoption with right now within the insurance world, because it does save a tremendous amount of legwork and money for the insurance company. So I guess for our US audience, it's still using inches. That would be what, about two and a half inches. So very high resolution. So then you've got very good high resolution data, but how does then the underwriter use that? Because they're not going to be looking at that kind of level of resolution to figure out if some bit of roofing is, is, is going to cause problems. How do you take, you know, you solve one problem, you create a new problem. You've now got lots of data. Someone who needs to make a decision, they're not going to spend a lot of money on it because they've got their own margins to manage. So how do you go from you know, now solving the next problem you've created by solving the last problem? Well, you know, think of, there's two ways to think of it. Think of it from the insurer's perspective and think of it from the policyholder, the customer. Think of it from the customer perspective. I walk outside, I look at my roof and I think I got a roof. I look around my property and, you know, my swimming pool is empty. I don't have a defensible perimeter. And I look at that and say, hey, this is my life. I need insurance. Insurance companies look at that and say, wow, Matthew, you've got fire hazards, you've got an empty swimming pool, your roof needs to be replaced. We take the image from, uh, we partner with a company by the name of Vexel. Uh, we take their imagery and we use our machine learning algorithms and we pull a hundred and approximately 170 attributes. What's an attribute? Things like roof slope, condition, trampolines, pools, the configuration of the roof, you know, things like, is there debris around? How much vegetation do you have up against your house? And we can analyze all of this and carriers can pick the things that are most important for their own algorithm so that they can look at this when they assess the risk score of your property. And they say, wow, Matthew, you're kind of a high risk. And so that if you look at it from the consumer side, they just look at it and they need their house. But more and more, Matthew, what we're seeing is insurance companies wanting to engage with the policyholder and say, we can lower your policy if you do these things. One, two, three. Because again, we have analyzed every residential property in the United States and Australia. So it's already pre there. So our customers go in, they pull the address that's already been analyzed. And the next time there's an image available that's a new image, we analyze that one. So you can compare the two, hence the past, present, and future of property. But that helps tremendously for the mitigation of risk in underwriting a property that is, uh, that is high risk that you know you're going to lose money on. So, that, but again, that's very helpful. I just want to come back to something you said at the start there, which is a, you used the term insurance companies or carriers looking at the data, but, but actually you were talking about that in the sense of their algorithms or at least essentially they're connecting to your data points. And most of these are going to be automated analytics around risk selection and, and pricing. I guess there might be some cases where you've got maybe higher net worth individuals, higher value properties where they do still want to actually look more carefully at the imagery to get a sort of get a close look if something's a bit unusual. Is that would that be right? Well it depends on the on the insurance carrier. There are still some that will do that will have a visual look at the property. Others are trying to move to complete automation. So there's a wide discrepancy between uh, carriers and the way that they actually process this data for underwriting. Thanks. And then this point about the past, present, and the future, let's start to sort of break that apart. So how are you getting information and sort of how far back do you go into the past when you're looking at looking at properties? So we can go back and run an analysis on images, no matter how far back they go. Uh, so it depends on how far back, oh, a property was insured by a specific carrier or images are available. So let's just say five years. We don't need to go back any further than that. If I want to go back and look and see when a roof was replaced on a certain house and do it, you know, just do change detection, and I'm about to insure that property and I know the roof was replaced two years ago, I know the roof is going to be good because I can see from the imagery two years ago that the roof had been replaced, right? So, and it especially is valuable with fraud detection, right? Because if someone is claiming that 
you know, they had a storm come through and they had roof damage. And so the insurance company pays a claim, but they don't fix their roof. But another storm comes through in six months. We can actually look back at the image and say, no, they never fixed their roof in the first place. So this is insurance fraud. So the past, present and future of property, you know, that's that is what that is is referring to, because we can go back and look at the property, the characteristics, the attributes of the property. We can tell if a property has added a thousand square feet, added a new story on it, increased their square footage. All of that goes to what was there and what is there now and has there been a change. And what about the future then? So how are you using your crystal ball to help insurers? Well, there's a lot of predictive analytics that go into this. So, you know, if we have access to the soil type or we have access to are there drought conditions, if we have access to additional information that's publicly available that shows that, um, you know, that a certain area nearby has been susceptible to flooding and the floodplain is moving a little bit uh, to the to toward the properties that are being insured. So all of this goes into the future of it, right? Because when you underwrite a house, you're betting on the future of the safety of that property. So if you know that uh, there have been there's been a massive drought and there's been fires being generated, whether it's lightning strike, human, or whatever the case may be, and that is a high risk area, you would have to increase the premium to cover those areas for fire hazard, right? Just, you know, to get your premium on your house, it's going to be increased. So the future of that property can be predicted based on certain parameters that are being tracked, whether it is uh, weather patterns, which is becoming much more difficult to track. I was on a call two hours yesterday with a carrier out of Australia, and right now, floods, fires, cyclones, it's all happening in areas where they have millions of policies underwritten, and being able to forecast that is something that is just getting more and more difficult. Right, just the the weather patterns they, they they've changed changed dramatically. And the, yeah, and the locations in particular. So areas that previously weren't at risk from tornado and hail are now suddenly becoming you know, exposed to those. We saw a freeze in Texas a couple of years ago. I mean, it is a, that's a, it's not just that the actual f- forecasting within places you expect to get those perils are happening. They're happening everywhere. So I wanted you to pick up something else you mentioned in passing, but I know it's another area of the business for you, which is more specifically on the on the claims side. So. So an event happens, damage occurs. What happens then with Arturo to sort of help your clients at that point? Any insurance company that has underwritten a property, you know, they anticipate that a certain percentage of them will have something go wrong, whether it is a flooded basement, whether it is a kitchen fire, whether it is hail damage, whatever the case may be. But there's a certain percentage of the policies that you're going to have something go wrong. And especially as it relates to a natural disaster, a catastrophe, right? Where, like I mentioned, being on the call with an Australian carrier yesterday, where they have, you know, I think 1,500 policyholders that their homes are in some variation of, you know, a foot of water or eight feet of water under that. And, you know, what's the flood damage? So the way that we help out with claims is after something has occurred, as long as you have the before image analysis, you can then take what's called gray sky imagery, which is imagery that's taken immediately following some sort of an event, right? Some, let's just say a storm comes through a, a certain area in Tennessee and it's one inch uh, diameter hill and it damages roofs. Well, we take the image that was there before, we process the gray sky imagery that as soon as it becomes available, and we can tell the carrier the extent of damage that has occurred. So they can immediately begin to process claims based on algorithmically derived uh, data that we have from analyzing the roof instead of sending somebody out to crawl up on the roof. Sending somebody out to crawl up on the roof has so much hazard to it that insurance companies don't even do that anymore, right? I mean, it's just, it's, it's too hazardous. So for us to be able to evaluate the extent of damage, report that back so that the carrier can immediately start to interact with the policyholder. The thing that is probably the the most, I would say, valuable 
asset that you have, your, your home, and something goes wrong with it, you want to feel taken care of by your insurance provider. So, you know, in essence, this will enable the insurance carrier to take a blanket over to the, you know, metaphorically speaking, a blanket over to the policyholder and say, hey, we got you. We know what happened. We know the extent of it. And we're going to start helping you immediately take care of this. Yeah, they're very interesting. And of course, that then also reduces further loss because if you get in there early and cover up damaged roofs or do other mitigation methods, it's very significant for reducing the, the long-term loss. So that makes lots of sense. Uh, and then one thing I also wanted to talk about is it, we have first had a conversation with your predecessor, John Isaac Clark, back in April 2022. Yeah, lots happened since then. A uh, very popular episode, by the way, uh, Marty, 1,400 downloads on that. But I mean, the big, one of the biggest things that's happened since then is we've all, well, I, mean, you, I suspect you may have known about it before many of us, but but most of us were discovering generative AI and, and the, you know, the incredible power of being able to use that alongside more traditional AI. And you mentioned machine learning. How are you, or what would be maybe, what would be an example you could point to about how you're using you know, large language models or generative AI tools to to really enhance the ability to understand what things we've been talking about, the risks and characteristics of the properties you're looking at? So this is probably the single most discussed advancement in technology anywhere. You know, I think we're getting through the hype cycle on Gen AI and we're getting down to what really matters with it. So for us, and I come from a, uh, a big data, a, a deep learning background. I was CEO of a, a big data company for, um, for quite some time. And, you know, we held, I think, like 240 patents on the way that supercomputing works and how, uh, how it is used in modeling. So, you know, for us, we have been using modeling for quite some time. So generative AI is something that we're embracing heavily. But even before getting down into the gen AI piece of this, you know, we have been using machine learning for the last oh, several years. And the way that we're using this is we are able to take and train our models. For example, let's say that you have a certain characteristic or a certain attribute that you want to measure and include in a risk assessment. Let's just say you want to know how wide the gutters are on a house or, or on a building, a commercial building. Well, in order to put that into a system that can be automated, it has to be trained first. So the training process, and again, this goes back to the more you know, the more you can know, the training process takes some time because you still have to train the model. Now, the wonderful thing about uh, AI in general is eventually you are going to be able to bring in and back up. The reason you train it is because it needs to be structured, right? You need to say, uh, yes, that is an image of Matthew. And I see 300 images of Matthew and I circle Matthew in every one of the images. And so my system now knows that, yes, that's Matthew. So anytime there is an image sent into my system and it's asked, hey, is that Matthew? We say, no, we know it's not Matthew. Well, it's very similar to gutter width. It's very similar to debris on a roof, debris in a yard. It's very similar to vegetation, right? You have to train those models. Well, AI... And we're, again, we're fully embracing, especially the tools that uh, that uh, enable a lot of AI, whether it's Llama or Hugging Face or Anthropic. I mean, these are great tools to use to quicken this process. But eventually, we will be bringing in any form of data that, and data we didn't have to circle Matthew every time, the algorithms before it ever gets to us or in the process of getting to us will identify and structure and label the data for us. And then we'll be able to use those data for large language model training, which is which is the future. Every big company that handles large amounts of data, they have to be looking at ways to incorporate the tools involved with generative AI to quicken the process that they have. And, and the results are remarkable. The hype cycle going away and the actual output is uh, is starting to manifest itself in many different ways. And of course, they you know we're at the crux of that on the insurance side when it comes to analyzing imagery. And Marty, the benefit of, well, me tapping into your benefit of your career and knowledge on this 
is another aspect of what generative AI can offer here is the ability to understand and define the uncertainty more effectively because or and work with uncertain data because it seems like the generative AI tools have evolved to be able to work with uncertainty and actually seem to be getting better at avoiding hallucinations. Is that another part of this when it comes to data, when you've got you know, a lot of data still quite uncertain or your your definition of the image has got uncertainty in it? Is that, are those generative AI tools also allowing you know, better results because they can treat uncertainty better and process higher volumes of data to be able to reduce that uncertainty? It's a great question, Matthew, because the lack of trust in AI is what is preventing some from fully embracing it. But, you know, the AI is a tool. Right now, it is kind of garbage in, garbage out. Hallucinations occur when you bring in an unstructured, unlabeled data. We don't know if that's a, a an image of Matthew, but we know it's a human. So we'll just put it in and we'll say it's Matthew. So, you know, I end up with a an image of Marty, but we say it's Matthew because the data wasn't uh, labeled or it wasn't structured. Well, AI will overcome that uh, in the near future. And the, you know, instead of having a bias toward hallucination, people will have a 99.99. It might not be five nines, right? I mean, I remember being in the carrier, wireless carrier world, everything had to be five nines, 99.999% uptime accuracy. We'll get there uh, we'll begin with the nine nine, and then we'll get to nine nine point nine, and we'll get there with accuracy, uh, because technology is on our side there. But the the funny thing about this is, right now, with enough data, you know, there's a really funny scene in a movie by the name of Groundhog, where Bill Murray is the character, and he says, you know, maybe God doesn't know everything. Maybe he's just been around so long that. He's experienced everything to the point where he knows what's going to happen. What a great description of AI, right? The more data you can get in about a certain thing, the better the predictability is going to be, obviously. But it also eliminates hallucinations. And you look at uncertainty. The most uncertain thing that we're trying to incorporate into models is weather patterns right now. Because they've just become unpredictable. So that's going to be a tough one because machines don't do well with unpredictability right now. But with enough data, they will be able to predict unpredictable things with enough data, right, in theory. So again, technology's on our side there. No, Martin, that's a great movie. I've never heard anybody do what effectively you've done. If you described Bill Murray in Groundhog Day, as a, a, a probabilistic model, because he keeps getting up in the morning, and for those who haven't seen it, every day repeats itself, and he learns each day. It's not quite a probabilistic model, I guess. I'm probably slightly twisting it, but it's that point about you. You do enough, maybe like a, more like a Monte Carlo simulation before we get too technical. But you do enough repeats, and you start to see the the for the well back on algorithms again that actually define the input and the output. But we better, I suspect you and I might end up getting too much into a technical depth. So let's come back to talk about some real real clients you've got. So I, I know you've been doing quite a lot with Suncor in Australia. Uh, it'd be great just to hear some sort of practical examples of how you've been working with them and, and helping them. Yeah, so Suncor in Australia, they very interesting company, very progressive company. They have a dual type of role. Um, they do underwrite millions of uh, commercial as well as residential properties. They also have uh, auto uh, and every other type of insurance you can imagine. Uh, but they also work very closely with the Australian government in the case of, think of FEMA and the way that FEMA is deployed in the U.S. Well, they work very closely with that agency in Australia to provide them with uh, post-processing and also pre processing of data as it relates to, you know, potential storms, floods, fires, uh, cyclones coming in. And, you know, it's it's always interesting because you, you can, a cyclone or a hurricane is very predictable, right? We have two different weather sources that track hurricanes. One's the European model, one's the US model. And so, you know, you can prepare for a hurricane. It might change course, but you can at least prepare for a hurricane. And so there's a lot of preparation that can take place. And Suncor helps do a lot of that because they're tracking, they're looking at where these things are going to hit. And then, you know, right now I spent a couple hours yesterday with them 
Um, and it was about flooding, some floods that are taking place that, you know, we've never seen flooding like this in Australia. In New Zealand this is the same boat here. But so they kind of have a dual role. But the way that we work with Suncorp is we actually provide them with image analysis. And we essentially their machine learning platform is Arturo. And we bring in third-party data like iSci. Uh, iSci is a uh, awesome company that uh, has satellite data and it, and it focuses on floods. So we're able to incorporate their data. We know the flood depths, we know the flood flow, we know all of that information. We're able to overlay that in a very graphic fashion with another product that we provide, which is our web app. It's the visual layer. and. You know, once you take all of this information, you know, whether it's incoming hurricane, cyclone, or whether it is a after a storm has happened, and you overlay that on a map, this becomes extremely powerful. And these guys do it better than anyone that I've that I've seen. Overlay it on a map, and you can actually, as a storm comes through, if there is damage they can immediately, once the gray sky's been analyzed, they can immediately look at the before and after, right side by side. They can look at Matthew's house and say, here's what it was yesterday, here's what it looks like today, and you know, um, measure the extent of the damage. But they are an entity that embraces new tech just rapidly. And you know, we've been able to work with them for the last several years and deploy our entire suite of products there. So it's it's been a very good relationship. And, you know, again, they just continue to push the envelope and be very progressive. So keeps us on our toes in a, in a way that I think is very beneficial for us because we want to work with insurance companies that are willing to push the envelope a little bit and implement new technologies because there are some great ones out there that can change the way that uh, that property is viewed through our platform. Well, they've got the benefit uh, and also the, the investment to go and build their own satellites. And then the, you know, part of the reason they can do what you described is they, they actually deploy their satellites on site. We actually did an event with them a couple of years ago and we had a mock-up, life-size mock-up of their satellite in the room hanging above people's heads. So we all got a very good sense as to what the size of it is and, and what it looks like. But it's great to see that, that working together. Martin, I'm conscious that we're coming up to our time, we've got a bunch of people listen to us out in their run or their exercise and uh, or their commute into work, and we want to let them get off their bike or get into work. Uh, we covered a lot in there. Is there anything that we I didn't ask you or is important to talk about before we uh, before we wrap things up? You know, Arturo is a company that you know four and a half years old, and in that four and a half years, we've been able to make some tremendous progress when it comes to using the technology to enhance the capability of insurance companies to do underwriting as well as to handle claims and detect fraud. The one thing that will always have to happen is someone is going to have to analyze what is being underwritten. And as we go into the mortgage business and as we start working more and more with county tax assessors to determine change on a, a residential home in a especially in the US where you know county tax assessors they they want to know if there's been an expansion of a home if they've added a tennis court if they've built in a swimming pool these change the values of the properties right mortgage underwriters they they are underwriting a property that they might have to take back someday so you know hey is it a good bet is it a safe bet right and you know as as the application of our software stretches out into other verticals, you know, I think insurance will benefit from every single bit of it. And certainly when you're insuring the thing that is most valuable for you and your family, you want to make sure that that you are being taken care of. And I, you know, in, in, in general, our platform more and more is helping bridge the insurance company with the policyholder because they have an interaction that they can undergo. And that is, hey, we can save you money if you're willing to do certain things to your property to improve the safety of it. Or, hey, we know something happened, we know how bad it is, and we're here to take care of you, and we can immediately start to handle your claims. And that's one of the biggest advantages of our platform is we quicken the claims process considerably. Good, thanks. And I just realized we're trying to avoid 
too many acronyms. Most of the, well, every insurance company in the US and will know FEMA, but for those that aren't familiar with FEMA, that's actually the Federal Emergency Management Agency that, as you said, deals with uh, the sort of disasters. So we mentioned that a couple of a couple of minutes ago. And then, Marty, finally, so you've painted a very good case for what Arturo does. What next for somebody that wants to get into the next level of detail and, and learn about you? Well, I would point them to Arturo.ai, which is our website. We have uh, some very good demos there. And also you can you can contact us through our website. You know, we've got some great customers, some of the world's largest insurance companies. And, you know, it's a proven technology. And, you know, it is, uh, it's a privilege to work with a lot of these companies. And if you're interested in learning more, please reach out to us through Arturo.ai. And uh, we'll make sure that uh, we'll make sure that we uh, we get you whatever information you're looking for. Excellent. And then another plug for both of us because we're doing a webinar together. And finally, I think the world has got past its COVID fatigue with digital events because we're seeing a really strong takeoff of digital events. We're getting three or four hundred people now. Uh, so really looking forward to that. And actually, it reminds me, we actually believe we're going to be having ISI on that. And that will live after the live event. So another chance actually to see things in action. And of course, we'll put some links in the episode notes and on the website uh, as well. So lots of ways to to find you. But Marty, you really appreciate appreciate you taking the time out. For us, it's the end of the day on Friday. You've still got a day ahead of you. So you've got the excitement of another day at Arturo. But I hope also we get to see each other face to face at some point. We're more and more over in the US days, the US these days physically as well as digitally. So thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me on, Matthew. I really appreciate it. Instech is officially coming to the US to bring the future of underwriting closer to you. Join us to discover the new tools leading insurance organizations are using to remove the pain from underwriting and let underwriters concentrate on what they do best. This event is sponsored by Saitora, Hyper Exponential, Google Cloud, and Kroll. The full program will be confirmed in the new year. Okay, that's it for today. www.instech.co for more information or me, Matthew Grant, on LinkedIn. Please contact me anything you want to hear about or tell us what you think about the podcast or hello at instec.co for anybody in the team. That's it. We're done.